Father in heaven, we thank you for the new day that you've given us, for a chance to come together to study your word this morning. We trust that you have a blessing in store for us. But Lord, we know that we cannot receive that blessing without the guidance of your Holy Spirit. Please, Father, send your Holy Spirit to us in a powerful way this morning. May you open our hearts and minds to better understand your truth, to see its import into our lives and be able to apply the things that we study in a practical way. Lord, please speak through me. May I only share your words. It's in Jesus' name I ask. Amen. Turn with me in your Bibles to Daniel chapter 0. Daniel chapter 0, verse 1. Oh, you don't know where that is? I appreciate Dr. Simon's message last night. How many were here last night? Okay. Were you blessed? That was a blessing. And Dr. Simon talked a lot about the need to stand alone. He talked about the character of Daniel. These are important things that we need to consider. Daniel and his three friends were representatives of the final generation. Daniel and his three, Daniel specifically is a representative of the final generation for a few different reasons. Can you give me any? In what way is Daniel or his three friends a representative of the final generation? Their character. Excellent reason. Any others? Persecution. Persecution. I heard another. They were a minority. They were standing firm. The health message. There are many reasons we could give. For one, they were a remnant. Isn't the final generation to be a remnant? They were tested on the matter of worship. Daniel in the lion's den, the three friends for the fiery furnace, tested on the matter of worship. Daniel specifically is a representative of the final generation in that he lived until the time of Cyrus. Cyrus is a type of Christ in the Bible. Daniel went through a time of tribulation, through the time where Babylon ruled the world, and he lived until the time of Cyrus, representing Jesus, representing that last generation who will live through a time of crisis, through the time when Babylon rules the world, until the time that Jesus comes. So I appreciate our emphasis this weekend on the story. Of, now, I should, I should mention when Brother Restrepo asked if I would speak this weekend for the convocation, I, of course, said that would be a privilege. I would, I would love to come. And I didn't know what I would speak about, though. I thought about it. I direct an organization focused on true education. That's what I talk about. That's what I do. So I, I knew that was the general topic, but true education is a big topic. What will I specifically focus on? And I thought, you know what? Actually, I prayed about it. And I felt impressed, speak upon the education of Daniel. I had no idea what the topic was going to be this weekend. And then when I sent that, that um, title in, at the same time that they told me what the, what the topic would be this weekend about dare to stand alone, dare to be a Daniel, preparing the final generation, I said, wow, the Lord worked that out. So we are looking at educating the final generation. And while Dr. Saman last night talked about Daniel and standing alone. This morning, I would like to look at what will prepare the Daniels from an educational perspective. What will be the education of the Daniels who will stand firm? It's important that we are challenged to stand firm. But as Dr. Simon talked about last night, he said that will not happen by accident. That will not happen just merely happenstance. There will be something to prepare the generation that will stand firm. There will be something to educate the Daniels. And that's what I want to look at this morning. There's an old Hebrew maxim, which says that Jerusalem was destroyed because the education of her children was neglected. Jerusalem was destroyed because the education of her children was neglected. 
Think of that. The historians, those wise in Israel, knew that the nation could have been saved if the children had been properly educated. Why did the people fall into idolatry? Why did the kings turn aside from the Lord and lead the nation astray? It was because the training of the children had been neglected. The Lord had given clear instruction as to the education of Israel's children. They were to be taught in the ways of the Lord without the corrupting influences of the nations around them. They had been called to be a peculiar people. Does that sound familiar? Are we called to be a peculiar people? But instead, they mingled with the heathen. They lost their distinctness. They were worried about being too different, about fitting in, about succeeding in the world. And they allowed the world's philosophy to infect their own. They lost their reason for existence, and they were destroyed. God's purpose for his people has always been that they will be a light to those around them, has it not? Is God's purpose for us to be a light to those around us? In the days of the patriarchs, of Joseph in Egypt, in the time when Israel was called out of Egypt, in the days of the judges, in the days of the kings, in the captivity and out of captivity, no matter where their situation and down to us today, God has ordained that his people will be a light and a witness to those around them. But what is it that will keep our light burning? It is fidelity to his word. It is fidelity to educating our children in his word. And this message is clear in the book of Deuteronomy. Over and over, the Lord tells his people that fidelity to his word will result in blessings, and a lack of following his word will result in, in curses. It's clear. What was to ensure, though, that his people remained faithful to his word? Deuteronomy also makes that clear when it says, teach these things to your children. Over and over through that book, it says, here is my word, follow it and you will be blessed. And by the way, you must teach this to your children if you want to be successful. I'm going to read a few selections from a book by one of our pioneers, Stephen Haskell. God had an object in calling the Jewish nation to separate themselves from the other nations of the world. It was that his people might stand before the world as light bearers. As a beacon set on a hill, Israel was to send beams of light to the world. The plan of education made known to Israel through her prophets was the means of keeping that light burning. When this God-given plan was neglected, the light as a candle deprived of the life-giving oxygen burned dim. Then it was that the nation was pressed upon all sides by the foe. There's a Hebrew maxim which says, Jerusalem was destroyed because the education of her children was neglected. The prophecies of Daniel and the connected history prove the truth of this maxim. It may be added that the Jews were restored to Jerusalem as the result of the proper education of a few Hebrew boys. We see a few. How many? Four. Four who stood strong. Now, these are not just the ones that the Bible thought it convenient to mention. These were the ones and the only ones that stood strong in that time when they were taken to Babylon. They are representatives, as I've already mentioned, of a remnant, the final generation which will stand when Babylon rules the world. What will give them success? That is our question I want to answer this morning. What will give this final generation success? We can study the story of Daniel, and look at what gave him success to know what will give us success. Amen? So let's do that this morning. Throughout history, God's principles of education have been the key to preparing the spiritual strength of a generation. Whether an entire generation or just a small remnant, it is fidelity to God's methods of education that has given success. It was true in the case of Daniel. And as spiritual Israel, our message is the same. The Lord has given us clear instruction as to the education of our children. We're to teach them in the ways of the Lord without the corrupting influences of the world around us. 
We've been called to be a peculiar people, just as was Daniel. But are we worried about being too different many times? Are we worried about fitting in? Are we worried about succeeding in the world? Educational reform is the key to our light shining. So let us see what gave success to, this, to Daniel. To begin, though, we would need to go back to the beginning of time. We cannot start in Daniel chapter 1 to learn what gave Daniel success, because that is Daniel, Daniel chapter 1 begins with Daniel's success story. It doesn't give what gave Daniel success. So to understand what gave Daniel success, we must go back in history. And to do that, I would like to start at the very beginning of time. In the book Education, we're told that the system of education instituted at the beginning of the world was to be a model for man throughout all after time. A model for who? Man. For when? All time. Does this apply to us now? Well, it must. All time. Now, in any good educational program, we have four components. We must have a classroom. It doesn't have to be bricks and walls, but a place to study. We need textbooks. What else do we need? Teachers. What else? Students. All right, four things. Did we have that in the Garden of Eden? The Garden of Eden was the schoolroom. Nature was the lesson book. The creator himself was the instructor. And the parents of the family, human family, were the students. This was the plan given in the Garden of Eden. This was the model that was to be followed in all after time. Now, let me ask you something. If the instructor was God, as we've read, what was the content of the instruction? We would call that the Word of God. Right? It's not the written Bible that we have now. But the content of true education at the very beginning of time, designed as a model for us to use in all after time, was instruction in the word of God. The only difference was it was God himself giving it in the Garden of Eden, and now it is his written word that gives it to us now. Now, in this perfect system as given in Eden, what was the unit of organization? It was the family. The system of education established in Eden centered in the family. Adam was the son of God, and it was from their father that the children of the highest received instruction. Theirs, in a truest sense, was a family school. The, 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 the content was the word of God, and the unit of organization was the family. So, in God's plan of true education, as given in Eden, the content was the word of God. The unit of organization was the family. Now, was this sustainable? Could it last, or was this just a temporary thing? No, God designed that this would last forever. In fact, we read in the book Education that the Garden of Eden was a representation of what God desired that the whole earth to become. And it was his purpose that as the human family increased in numbers, they should establish other homes and schools like the one he had given. Thus, in the course of time, the whole earth might be occupied with homes and schools where the words and works of God should be studied and where the students should thus be fitted more and more fully to reflect throughout the endless ages the light of the knowledge of his glory. It was a beautiful educational program. What was the unit of, of organization? The family. What was studied? The word of God, truth, pure truth, nothing else. Now, did it stay this way? No, sadly not. God's perfect plan was not followed. And it was at the fall that we see the first mingling of the true and the false. It was at the fall that we first see man saying, you know what? I'm not going to trust God for the simple education of my family. I think I have more wisdom than God. And from that moment of distrust rose the woe of the ages. But now, after the fall, did God just say, well, you know, that ideal plan of education, that was a nice idea, it was a nice thought, but that's obviously not going to work anymore. So throw that out. Is that what God did? No. He slightly adjusted it. Listen to this, again from the book Education. In the divine plan of education as adapted to man's condition after the fall, now who does this apply to? Us, 
we're after the fall. So in the divine plan of education, as adapted to our condition right now, Christ stands as the representative of the Father, the connecting link between God and man. He is the great teacher of mankind, and he ordained that men and women should be his representatives. The family was the school, and the parents were the teachers. God's perfect plan was adapted after the fall, but it was not changed. The goal and the principles and the direction remain the same. No longer could he communicate face to face, but he ordained this system of representatives. Christ is the connecting link between the father, and then he would connect with the parents, and the parents would connect with the children. The content was the same, though. So, in the true education plan after the fall, the content was the word of God, the unit of organization was the family, and the teachers became the parents. Now, if we fast forward just a little bit to the days of the patriarchs, we find that the education centering in the family was that which prevailed in the days of the patriarchs. For the schools thus established, God provided the conditions most favorable for the development of character. What was the most favorable for the development of character? These schools that were established. What was the unit of organization? Within the family. The people who were under his direction, God's direction, still pursued the plan of life that he appointed at the beginning. Those who departed from God built for themselves cities... Oh, there's a whole sermon right there, isn't there? Those who departed from God built for themselves cities, but the men who held fast God's principles of life dwelt among the fields and hills. They were tillers of the soil and keepers of flocks and herds, and in this free, independent life with its opportunities for labor and study and meditation, they learned of God and taught their children of his works and ways. What was the unit of organization? The family. What was the content of the instruction? the word and works of God in the days of the patriarchs. Let's continue. The days of Moses, the bondage in Egypt. God needed a leader to bring his people out of Egypt. I hope you see the symbolism there. To accomplish this, to prepare a leader for this, was God's plan of education followed? It sure was. Let's read about Jochebed. It was with deep gratitude that Jochebed entered upon her now safe and happy task. She faithfully improved her opportunity to educate her child for God. She knew that he must soon be given up to his royal mother to be surrounded with influences that would tend to lead him away from God. All this rendered her more diligent and careful in his instruction. She kept the boy as long as she could, but was obliged to give him up when he was about 12 years old. The lessons learned at his mother's side could not be forgotten. They were a shield from the pride, the infidelity, and the vice that that flourished amid the splendor of the court. Who was the teacher? The mother. What was the content? The word of God. What was the results? Spiritual strength in a leader to bring his people out of Egypt. Pause with me for a moment, though, because this is a story that we see repeated oft throughout history. There were other mothers in Israel, too, were there not? Jochebed wasn't the only mother to have a child. But alas, the great majority neglected to be faithful in training their children in God's methods. They allowed, well, hey, they were busy, right? They were slaves. They had a good excuse, better excuses than we usually give, actually. But they allowed their children to grow up without this precious instruction. The children probably had Egyptian playmates. Maybe they went to Egyptian schools. I don't know. We don't, we're not told that. But what we do know, because inspiration does tell us, is that they mingled with the Egyptians and they allowed themselves to be influenced by the Egyptians' ways. So that when the time came to leave Egypt, they were poorly prepared. They didn't even want to leave some of them. But how was Moses able to stay strong? It was the fact that his mother, despite the difficulty, followed the Lord's plan in the education of her son. How much easier would it have been if the entire nation of Israel had followed God's plan in the education of the children, right? the entire wandering in the wilderness would not have happened because they would have been properly educated to follow the Lord. 
Now, let's keep going. <clears throat> I trust the tech team is sorting this out. Let's think about the story of Samuel. Now, Moses' mother had 12 years, right? How long did Samuel's mother have? Maybe three? Not much time. Did it change her way of, of educating, though? Think about if you were in that situation. We do have a slide, but we don't. Would it change your perspective if you knew you only had three years with your child? Uh, for 12 years, for that matter. <laughs> A short period of time, and yet she was successful. Hannah was successful. I'd like to read you something here as soon as this gets started back up. I'm not doing anything because they're operating this computer from up there. It's rather strange to see this happen. <laughs> All right, here we are with Moses. We saw Jochebed. Let's think about the story of Samuel and Samuel's mother. Patriarchs and Prophets, page 243. During the first three years of life, of the life of Samuel, the prophet, his mother carefully taught him to distinguish between good and evil. By every familiar object surrounding him, she sought to lead his thoughts up to the Creator. His early training led him to choose to maintain his Christian integrity. What led him to choose to maintain his integrity? His early training. What a reward was Hannah's, and what an encouragement to faithfulness is her example. Who was the teacher of Samuel? His mother. What was the content? The Word of God. What were the results? Spiritual strength. How about David? Over and over, this story was repeated in Israel. When families were faithful to God's plan of education, they raised youth of spiritual strength. And that was because they were following the instruction given in Deuteronomy. These words which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart, and thou shalt teach them diligently every evening when you come home from work. When? Talk of them. When thou sittest in thy house, when thou walkest by the way, when thou liest down, when thou risest up, all the time you were to give instruction in the word of God to your children. Deuteronomy is a book of education. Deuteronomy is a book of education covering all aspects of life. Education according to God's plan and given to his people is instruction in his word. I think you're still asleep this morning. God's plan of education as instructed and given to his people was instruction in his word. That was God's plan of education. But now we come to the story of Daniel. Let's look at Daniel chapter 0. We've already begun, <clears throat> but now we're midway through the chapter. Daniel, a man exhibiting a spiritual strength seen in but few in history. A man who, as a youth, stood for his faith at any cost. A man who represents those who will stand in the last days, a representative of the final generation. What was his training? What prepared him? Daniel's parents followed God's plan of education. You know, I didn't realize that until I started studying it, that we are actually told how Daniel was educated. I, I didn't realize it until I studied it out. But we are very clearly told, and I want to turn to a selection from Fundamentals of Christian Education, page 95. It's a bit long, but bear with me as we look at the process of how Daniel was educated. God commanded the Hebrews. What's the word used there? Commanded. This was not optional. God commanded the Hebrews to teach their children his requirements, to make them acquainted with all his dealings with his people. The home and the school were one. In the place of stranger lips, the loving hearts of father and mother were to give instruction to their children. We are clearly told this was the command. Mother and father, give instruction to your children. What was the unit of organization? Again, we're just reviewing here. What's the unit of organization? The family. Who are the teachers? The parents. What was the content? Well, let's keep reading. 
Thoughts of God were associated with all the events of daily life in the home dwelling. The mighty works of God in the deliverance of his people were recounted with eloquence and reverential awe. The great truths of God's providence and of the future life were impressed upon the young mind. It became acquainted with the true, the good, and the beautiful. What was the content? Truth, nature, sacred history. Again, it was a true education based in the word of God. By the use of figures and symbols, the lessons given were illustrated and thus more firmly fixed in the memory. Through this animated imagery, the child was almost from infancy initiated into the mysteries, the wisdom, and the hopes of his fathers, and guided in a way of thinking and feeling and anticipating that reached beyond things seen and transitory to the unseen and eternal. From infancy, it was instruction in the word of God. From this education, which education? The one we've just read about, where the, the family, the home and the school are one, teaching the children the truth of the Lord. From this education, many a youth of Israel came forth vigorous in body and mind, quick to perceive and strong to act. How many want youth raised like this? The heart prepared like good ground for the growth of the precious seed. The mind trained to see God in the words of revelation and the scenes of nature. The stars of heaven, the trees and flowers of the field, the lofty mountains, the babbling brooks, all spoke to him. And the voices of the prophets heard throughout the land met a response. Now you say, what does this have to do with Daniel? We're getting there. Such was the training of Moses in the lowly cabin home in Goshen. Of Samuel by the faithful Hannah of David in the hill dwelling at Bethlehem, of, of Daniel, before the scenes of captivity separated him from the home of his fathers and the life of Christ and Timothy, and I'm sure we could add more to the list. How was Daniel educated? In the way that we just described. The home, instruction in the word of God, nature, and the voices of the prophets. This was the training of Daniel. We are not left to guess about this. I want to go back to this description again just a moment, though. We saw it was in the home. We saw it was with the parents teaching. But let us focus on the content. Three things in particular. Watch this slide. I'm going to make the three things yellow here. Three items. Number one, the words of revelation. What is that? What would we call that today? The Bible. And part of this was the study of sacred history. God's leadings of his people in the past, and we're told that's vital in our children's education. The words of Revelation. The third thing, what was it? The scenes of nature. And what was the third? Voices of the prophets. Is the spirit of prophecy vital in the education of our children today? True education means study of the word of God. It means study of nature, and it means study of the spirit of prophecy. This is true education. This is what our children and youth should be studying. And what were the results? We just read it. From this education, many a youth of Israel came forth vigorous in body and mind, quick to perceive and strong to act. Do you want your children to be raised like this? Now, let's just make this super clear. I, for one, like diagrams and charts and graphs and such things. So let's put this in a chart. What was the environment? The home. Who were the teachers? The parents, father and mother. What was the instructional material? The word of God, nature, and the spirit of prophecy. What were the results? Spiritual strength. This was God's command to the Hebrews. And wherever it was followed, it was successful. And we just read it was followed in the education of Daniel. Now to more fully understand Daniel's story, let's turn in our Bibles to 2 Kings, 2 Kings chapter 20. This was our scripture reading this morning, 2 Kings chapter 20. Here we find Hezekiah on his deathbed. We know the story well. Hezekiah was going to die. He prayed. The Lord was merciful, gave him an extension of his life. And Hezekiah said, how do I know for sure that I will have my life extended? And God offered to give him a sign. What was the sign that Hezekiah chose? Make the sundial go backwards. What a God we have that will disrupt the order of the entire universe to assure us 
of his healing. Wow. But nonetheless, that caught the attention of the Babylonians because they studied astronomy. They said, um, this isn't normal for the sun to go backwards. What, what happened? So they inquired on global news and they found, oh, Hezekiah healed, sun goes backwards. Well, we need to go see Hezekiah because his God is evidently more powerful than ours. So they go and pay a visit to Hezekiah. Hey, Hezekiah, congratulations. We heard, we heard you were healed. How wonderful that is. And we heard it was your God that did it. And, and more than that, your God can actually move the sun? Is this for real? Tell us about it. And what did Hezekiah do? Yeah, let me show you my treasures. What a mistake. And it was right after they did that, right after Hezekiah did that, I imagine the Babylonian visitors were probably leaving, and Isaiah the prophet passes them on the way out, coming in to speak to Hezekiah, and basically told Hezekiah, Hezekiah, what were you thinking? That wasn't smart. And because of your mistake, we read in verse 17, 2 Kings chapter 20, verse 17, behold, the days come that all that is in thine house and that which thy fathers have laid up in store unto this day shall be carried into Babylon. Nothing shall be left, saith the Lord. And of thy sons which they, sorry, that shall issue from thee, which thou shalt beget, they shall take away, and they shall be eunuchs in the palace of the king of Babylon. Of thy sons that shall issue from thee they shall take away. Now imagine with me that you were a mother right then. A mother with sons. A mother in the royal family at this period in earth's history. What would you do? You know the end is near. You know that your sons may be taken captive to serve in the court of the king. What would you do? You know that they may be called to stand before kings to answer for their faith. I hope you see the parallels today. What would you do? This choice was presented to every Hebrew mother. Some no doubt thought, no doubt thought to themselves, if my son will serve in the court of the king, then I will be as Jochebed. I will be as Samuel, as uh, Hannah, Samuel's mother. I will raise my son so he will be faithful to the God of his fathers. But unfortunately, there were others who lightly let that thought pass. Again, back to Stephen Haskell's description here. Three years after his life had been saved, a son was born to Hezekiah. Notwithstanding the recent prophecy, Hezekiah and his wife Hephzibah failed to teach the young Manasseh in the way of truth. He was but 12 years of age when he came to the throne, but if he had been trained in the fear of God, he would not have chosen the worship of the heathen. At the age of 12 years, Christ made a decision which saved the world. At the same age, Manasseh chose a course which brought ruin to the nation in the training of your child. Are you Hephzibah or Mary? And yet, the Lord was merciful, was he not? How long did Manasseh rule? 55 long years. That is mercy. Destruction did not immediately come. But yet this was long enough for a generation to pass. Long enough for those initial impressions to wear off. Long enough for people to begin to forget that their sons may be carried into captivity. People began to say as they do now, all things continue as they have since the beginning. And then it was in the days of Josiah, the grandson of Manasseh, that again this prophecy came. Babylon was described. Jerusalem's impending doom was portrayed. The grandson of Manasseh was good king Josiah. And it was Josiah's reforms that conclude Daniel chapter 0. It was Josiah's reforms which directly prepared Daniel to stand in the court of the king of Babylon. I wish we had some more information about Josiah's mother. But somehow, from the age of eight, when he began to reign, he was determined from the very beginning he would be different. 
He was determined to do what is right. The Bible says that he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord and turned neither to the right hand or the left. Josiah, as we know, began a, a program of reform around the nation. He destroyed the altars. He broke down the high places and many other important reforms. But the reform I would like to focus on was the fact that they were restoring the temple. And in the process of restoring the temple, they found something. What was it that they found? The book of the law. Now, if something was found, what did that mean? It had been lost. So what brought about the apostasy of Judah? They had lost the book of the law. And what was about to bring a reform? They found the book of the law. So they found this book of the law. They brought it to Josiah. And as they read it to him, he was, he was convicted. But before I get to that, I want to just mention that in Josiah's reforms, we find three steps in educational reform. How many here want to be educational reformers? We should all want to be educational reformers. Here we find three steps, and I'm sure we could uh, extrapolate some more, but three steps in true education reform. The first thing that Josiah did was, if we get this to work, a return to the word of God. They found the book of the law, and he began studying the book of the law. We saw earlier that true education is based in the word of God. So an educational reform must mean a return to that on which true education is based. And what was in that book of the law? Well, it wasn't the whole Bible as we know it. It probably contained uh, the books of Moses, but at least the book of Deuteronomy. And there, as the scribe Shaphan, Shaphan read, the king heard the blessings and curses set forth in that book of Deuteronomy. He heard set forth the need for the education of the children in the word of God. He heard that the nation's prosperity, nay, its survival, depended upon adherence to the word of God. He saw that they were a disobedient people, and it was then that the Bible says he rent his clothes. We read in Prophets and Kings, as the king read the prophecies of swift judgment upon those who persist in rebellion, he trembled for the future. The perversity of Judah had been great. What was to be the outcome of their continued apostasy? Friends, do we tremble for the future? Do we understand our need for the education in the word of God? Do we understand that our prosperity, our survival depends upon our adherence to the word of God? Do we consider our departures from the word of God and tremble as did Josiah? What will be our response? I pray it will be the same as Josiah's. Secondly, we saw that true education included the spirit of prophecy. Thus, educational reform must involve a return to the spirit of prophecy. We read again, Prophets and Kings, that the silent yet powerful influence is set in operation by the messages of the prophets regarding the Babylonian captivity did much to prepare the way for a reformation that took place in the 18th year of Josiah's reign. So the, the messages of the prophets did a lot in this reformation. They, they helped pave the way and set the stage. More than that, though, there was a prophetess living at that same time by the name of Huldah. And when Josiah was awakened to their condition as a people, when he saw the need to return to the word of God, when he heard those prophecies about the destruction of Jerusalem, he said, I must inquire of the Lord. And he went to the prophetess Huldah. Just a side note. I wonder if it's a coincidence. We saw that Daniel was a representative of the final generation. And it was a prophetess who helped in that reform of Josiah that prepared that final generation. Sounds familiar, doesn't it? Anyway. Go ye, inquire of the Lord for me, Josiah said. And they went to Huldah the prophetess. And what was the message? No, I'm sorry. The doom will still come. The nation will be destroyed, but it won't happen during your lifetime, Josiah, because of the work that you're doing. Now, what did the king do when he heard those words? 
Did he say, well, okay, that's good to know. At least it won't happen in my time. I've done a good work. Okay, I, I, you know, I'll pass my days in peace. No, he said, I'm going to do all that I can. Let's start a reading program. Let's gather the people. Let's instruct them in the word of God. Let's prepare them for the crisis that was to come. When, when Josiah heard the prophecies about what was to come, he worked even harder. And thus began the third step in educational reform, an education of the family. We read this in 2 Kings chapter 23 and verse 2. The king went up into the house of the Lord, and all the men of Judah and all the inhabitants of Jerusalem with him, and the priests and the prophets and the people, both small and great. And he read in their ears all the words of the book of the covenant which was found in the house of the Lord. What's the content as we've been going through this morning? The word of God. Who was being instructed here? It specifically says all the people, small and great. I love this picture we've seen where we see old and young children, parents, everyone was being instructed in the word of God. It reminds me of the time in Deuteronomy when Moses specifically said to call the people together and he even named, please bring the little babies too. Everyone should be instructed in the word of God. We read earlier from infancy, they were to be inculcated with the word of God. So the reforms of Josiah prepared a remnant to stand in the last days as we're studying this morning. What were those reforms? They were educational in nature. Now, the date of the reading of the law, I, I should have put a chart here up on the, on the screen, but the date at which this happened was two years before Daniel was born. The date of the reading of the law was two years before Daniel was born. So who was in the audience of the reading of the law? Daniel's parents. This is Daniel chapter zero. Daniel's parents were listening to that reading of the law. And what did they hear? Friends, what did they hear in the reading of the law? They heard the book of Deuteronomy. They heard a book detailing the instruction they were to give their children. They heard in chapter 4 and verse 6 that obedience to God's word was the condition for being a light to the nations. They heard in chapter 4, chapter 6, Chapter 8, that obedience to God's word was a condition of entering the promised land. They heard that obedience to God's word was a condition of prosperity. They heard that obedience to God's word was a condition of God fulfilling his covenant. They heard it was a condition of prosperity, a condition of a blessing of fruitfulness, a condition of health, a condition of leadership, of holding their place above the other nations. They heard that the word of God was to be esteemed as important as physical food. They heard that it was a condition of them being the greatest nation. They heard the blessings. They heard the curses. They heard it was a condition of their crops being productive. They heard that it was a condition of their enemies being defeated. They heard that adherence to the word of God was a condition of being a holy people. It was a condition of being the head and not the tail. They heard the blessings for obeying, the curses for not obeying. They even heard in Deuteronomy chapter 28, verse 49, that captivity would come if they did not obey the word of God. And they heard in chapter 30 that if they returned to God, they could return from captivity. This is what they heard from the book of Deuteronomy. Perhaps they even heard Psalm 119 where they read that God's word, adherence to God's word, is a condition of not being ashamed. It was a key to not sinning. It was a condition of freedom. It was a source of meditation, a condition of being wiser than their enemies. God's word was how they were to be teachers of the world. They heard it was a source of their light and understanding. They heard that adherence to God's word was a condition of peace. Perhaps they even heard the story of Hezekiah, that the key to Hezekiah's prosperity was obedience to God's word. This is what they heard. And then they heard, again, throughout the book of Deuteronomy, that these words which I command thee this day, the words you have heard in the reading of the law, shall be in thine heart, and thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children, and thou shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thine house, when thou walkest by the way, when thou liest down, and when thou risest up. 
Commit these words that you have heard into your heart and teach them to your children. This is what Daniel's parents heard as they stood in that audience listening to the reading of the law in Josiah's reforms. And then, as they were awakened to their responsibility in the education of their children, as they understood now what their job was to be, their attention was turned to the spirit of prophecy. They were reminded of the prophecies of Isaiah and others, pointing forward to the Babylonian captivity. They were told that inquiry had been made to the prophetess Huldah, and the king, no doubt with tears in his eyes, said, I have inquired of the Lord and the doom will still come. They were told by the king himself that destruction would come. And because of the sins of their fathers, their doom was certain. They knew that perhaps their own sons would be taken captive to serve in the court of the king of Babylon. Think about that. Think about the timing there. Josiah inquired of the Lord, will this doom come? And the, the, the word was, yes, it will come, but not in your lifetime. And, and the way it, I understand it, reading that, is it would have come right away, but instead, because of the reforms that you have initiated, we'll delay it a little bit longer. So as, Josiah, as Daniel's parents were listening to that, they could have easily had the impression, which would have been true, that the very next king would be the time of the Babylonian captivity. In other words, their children would be the remnant generation. What did they do? They obeyed. Four mothers, the mother of Daniel, the mother of Hananiah, the mother of Azariah, and the mother of Mishael, said, we will do as the Lord has commanded. We will instruct our children in the way of the Lord. We will prepare them for the time in which they will stand alone for their faith. They obeyed. Will we obey, friends? Will we recognize the times in which we are living? Will we realize that our children... This new generation coming upon the stage of action may very well be Earth's final generation. Will we prepare them for the test? As Haskell points out, Daniel had a godly mother who knew of the prophecy concerning the destruction of their city. She repeated to her son the words of God that someday Hebrew children must stand in the heathen court at Babylon. Carefully did this mother teach her son to read the parchment scrolls of the prophets. This education was not gained in the schools of the time, for they had departed from the plan of God. But holy mothers, living close to the everlasting Father, led their children by precept and example, by word and song to form characters that would stand the test. Mothers. Are you following the example of Daniel's mother? But what about the mother of Jehoiakim, Jehoiachin, of Zedekiah, of the other kings of Judah? What about their mothers? They were in the audience too. But alas, they neglected to obey the word of God. The capital was entered. Treasures from the house of God, were torn ruthlessly from their place and dedicated to the worship of the Babylonian gods. Youth, bright, promising youth, were torn from their homes and placed in their captivity. Daniel was taken. Daniel's friends were taken. They were placed under the charge of Aspenaz, away from the shelter of their home, away from the instructing care of their parents. What were the results? Was Daniel's mother, were Daniel's friends' mothers successful? I couldn't have said it any better than, again, Stephen Haskell. Now can be, seen, can be seen the results of home training. Pure food, clean thoughts, and the physical exercise placed them on the list of children in whom was no blemish but well favored. This was when they arrived in Babylon. But what of their intellectual ability? They had not been educated in the schools of Jerusalem, much less in those of Babylon. 
Was there not great danger that they lacked in the sciences or the essential branches? On examination, these four passed as skillful in wisdom and cunning in knowledge and understanding science. This was when they arrived in Babylon and able to learn a difficult foreign language. God had fulfilled his promise to these children of the homeschool. As the book Education says, Daniel and his companions had been faithfully instructed in the principles of the word of God. We are not left to guess. This was not an accident that Daniel obtained the spiritual strength that he had. Daniel's success was a result of true education. Daniel's success was a result of what? True education. What does that mean? What does that look like? These children had the Lord as their educator. That is true education. They were connected with the fountainhead of wisdom by the golden channel of the Holy Spirit. They kept continually a living connection with God, walking with him as did Enoch. They were determined to gain a true education, and in consequence of their co-partnership with the divine nature, they became in every sense complete men in Christ Jesus. And then, at the end of three years, at the, when they graduated from the University of Babylon, King Nebuchadnezzar himself tested their ability. How did they fare? these products of the homeschooled true education methodologies, how did they fare? Twice as smart as everyone else, right? Three times smarter. Five times smarter. Eight times smarter. Ten times wiser than all the magicians and astrologers. Who were those people? Those were Daniel's teachers. Ten times smarter than his teachers. How is that possible? This was not an accident. This was not by chance that this happened. How is this possible? We find the answer in the book of Proverbs where it says the fear of the Lord is the what? The beginning of wisdom. The foundation of the highest education is religious principle. Faith had been developed in childhood in Daniel and his friends. And when these youth had to act for themselves, they depended upon God for strength and efficiency in their labors. And they were richly rewarded. Where are the parents who today are teaching their children to control appetite, to look to God as the source of all wisdom? Our youth are daily meeting allurements to gratify appetite. Every form of indulgence is made easy and inviting, especially in our large cities. Those who steadfastly refuse to defile themselves will be rewarded, as was Daniel. Were these principles practiced, more young persons could be trusted as missionaries in responsible positions and in institutions of learning. Many will yet be called to stand before judges and kings. How are the children being educated? The lessons here are great. They are pertinent to the last days. Now, in spiritual Israel, how are we educating our children for the crisis? But now consider something with me. Remember that Babylon wasn't just powerful. Babylon was the educational center of the world. Every art and science was taught in Babylon. The wisdom of the ancients was made known to her students. They reveled in the study of astronomy, higher mathematics. There were linguists who could teach the language of every nation on earth. The king himself was highly educated and granted the degrees. And into this proud educational center of the world were thrust four young men, slaves from a despised race, and products of home education based in the word of God. How could they compete? Surely they were not prepared. And what do we read in Corinthians? Hath not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? In the Babylonian court, this was exemplified. Nebuchadnezzar and his counselors 
the wise men, the astrologers, the soothsayers standing on one side, representing the education of this world. And then Daniel, a youth not over 20 years of age, a Hebrew, a slave from a despised race, standing on the other. Called in before Nebuchadnezzar to interpret a dream. Daniel stood before the king. Around him stood the very teachers of his. Who could not interpret the dream? Who could interpret it? It was Daniel. Was Daniel somehow extra smart? He had more intelligence than his teachers in the matter of interpreting dreams? <clears throat> Excuse me. Not really. How was Daniel able to interpret that dream? It was because he was connected with the source of wisdom. How was Daniel to able to interpret the dream? He was connected with the source of wisdom. Friends, this is true education. You wonder what true education is? It is connecting our young people with the source of wisdom. When we are faithful to connect our children with the source of wisdom, we don't need to fear. Though they may be torn from us, though they may be surrounded with bad influences, they can be trusted. God can trust them because they are connected with him. This is true education. Psalm 119, 99 and 100. I have more understanding than all my teachers for thy testimonies are my meditation. I understand more than the ancients. Why? Because I studied longer than them? No, because I keep thy precepts. It is connection with the Lord. It is instruction in the word of God that will give us our place of leadership. And of course, a few years later in the story of the plain of Dura with the great golden image, symbolic of that last test that's to come on the world, it was again those who had been truly educated who were successful. Who will be able to stand the test when this decree to worship the beast to the image is enforced? Who will choose to rather to suffer affliction? Who will choose rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season? What children are now being trained and educated in these principles of integrity to God? From what homes will come the Daniels and the Meshachs? This will be the final test brought upon the servants of God. From what homes are coming the Daniels? From what homes are coming the Meshachs? We start at the beginning saying, what was God's purpose for his people? It was to be a light, wasn't it? A light to those around them. What was it that gave Daniel and his friends the ability to be a light to those around them? It was fidelity to his word. Will this be true for us? We read, it was in the providence of God that his people should carry the light of truth to all heathen nations. What they failed to do in time of peace, they must do in time of trouble. Will this be true for us? We're told that what we have failed to do in times of ease will have to be done under great difficulty. Who will do it? The remnant. The Daniels. Those who have been truly educated. Will we prepare them for this time? How were Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah prepared? How will it be for us today? Who will be faithful to God's plan of education? These representatives of that final generation on the earth subjected to the same tests that may be brought upon our youth. How were they prepared? Friends, did they prepare when they got to Babylon? Were Daniel and his friends prepared when they got to Babylon? No, they were prepared before then. Was it just a hope that they would be ready when the test came? No, they were prepared in the home from infancy. Long before they arrived in Babylon, they were prepared. How? In the family. Instruction in the word of God, nature, 
and the spirit of prophecy. In his wisdom, the Lord has decreed that the family shall be the greatest of all educational agencies. It is in the home that the education of the child is to begin. Here is his first school. Here with his parents as instructors, he is to learn the lessons that are to guide him throughout life. Which lessons are those? Respect, obedience, reverence, and self-control. Education 276, in closing this morning, never will education accomplish all that it might and should accomplish until the importance of the parent's work is fully realized, recognized, and they receive a training for its sacred responsibilities. What was it that prepared Daniel and his friends to stand? It was the fact that his mother and father had been instructed in the word of God in the days of the reforms of Josiah. That was what prepared them to educate that final generation. Parents, do you read and study the Word of God? Are you awakened to the responsibility God has placed upon you? Are you as a family studying the spirit of prophecy? Will you be faithful in instructing your children in the same Will you prepare them for the test which is soon to come on the world? Are you faithfully? Are you listening? Are you faithfully making every moment count? Knowing that at any time it may change. Are you putting yourself in the situation of Jochebed, of Hannah, of Daniel's mother, recognizing that every moment must count in the preparation of your child for a crisis. Are you faithfully making every moment count to prepare your children to stand alone, as did Daniel? Will you come out of Babylon? Will you prepare your children to come out of Babylon? Will you follow true education? Father in heaven, Lord, thank you for your instruction. Thank you for making this clear to us. But Lord, I'm sure this is challenging. Father, I pray you'll give strength. I pray you'll give us wisdom, foresight, earnestness, determination to follow your plan in the educating of the final generation. We thank you, Lord, for the time we've had this morning. We trust you have many more blessings in store for us today. We ask for your continued presence, and we ask in Jesus' name.